let's kick off week one of Letters for My Future Self. And I've been trying to think about how to best set up this series, this idea of my future self sending a letter to my current self. Like, what's the best way to think about my future self saying something to me right now? And the, the best way that I've thought about it is to ask, what would I say today to my younger self? Like, like if I could go back from today and give younger me wisdom, what would it be? Um, I know what some of it would be. I know that some of the wisdom I would want to give younger me, it would be wisdom like this. Just because your dad's musical doesn't mean you are. (laughs) Guys, Louis Armstrong was cool. Seventh grade trombone play in Matt was not. (laughs) Guys, it was so bad. I played trombone for two years and then they switched me to tuba in eighth grade and that somehow or another became worse. The middle school band director was so so desperate that she actually got the high school band director to come down and the high school band director, he was so intense and he would sit over me in practice and he would do this like hand, like beating thing and trying to keep me on pace. And he'd be right in my ear talking Well, my ADD would kick in. I'd start laughing at how silly he'd look, which would only make him matter, which would make me laugh more. And do you know what a laughing tuba sounds like? <laughs> I do. Um, do you want to know who didn't get invited to the high school marching band? This guy. But when I did get to high school, I did get a lot of high school spirit. And wisdom would say, face paint for the football game, great idea. Face paint 12 hours before the football game, terrible mistake. Do not go to school with face paint on because that junk will look like, it'll make you look like a demented joker by the end of the day. And you will have acne for weeks because of it. Wisdom would also say to younger me, Don't buy a fixer-upper if no one's mechanical in your family. (laughs) Guys, I bought this 74 Volkswagen Beetle as my first car. It was awesome. I had 15-inch subwoofers in it. I put Christmas lights in it. Had a hula girl in the back that would wave. (laughs) But I pushed that car more than I drove that car because none of us knew how to fix that car. Uh, Wisdom would also say to younger Matt, when you come on staff at a church, you don't need to grow your hair out like Jesus. I'll let you guess who the other two kids are in that photo. If you need help, you should tune into the LCBC podcast to figure out who they are. I don't know about you, but for me, it's somehow easier to look back and give younger Matt wisdom. Like hindsight seems to be 2020. We see things clearly looking back. It's one thing though to talk about face paint and bad haircuts, but can we also look back and give ourselves wisdom on who to date? and not to date, what to really worry about and what to stop worrying about, what to stress over and and what to just get over, what to buy and what do not buy. Do not put it on the credit card. It is not worth it. You will pay for it longer than you have it. Like, don't you just wish we could borrow wisdom from tomorrow today. So our future selves wouldn't have to say, what were you thinking? but rather our future selves could say, way to go. I'm so glad you did that. Or to say it another way, how do you make choices now that future you will love? How do you make choices now that future you will love? Because let's be honest, none of us wanna screw this life up more. Uh, We all wanna do the best that we can, but sometimes our best, our wisest, just doesn't seem to be wise enough. Uh, So no matter where you're starting from, what's already been done, how do we choose from today, right now, moving forward to live wisely, Uh, to live in such a way that our future self will say, thank you, well done. And today, uh, I want to do everything I can to help us answer two questions. I wanna do everything I can to help us answer the question, why do I need wisdom and how do I get wisdom? Why do I need wisdom and how do I get wisdom? Because when we orient our lives, choose to turn our lives towards wisdom, it will profoundly change the trajectory of our lives. So to help us get there, I wanna introduce us to a really fascinating book in the Bible. Did you guys know that there's actually an entire book in the Bible dedicated to helping us be wise, to grow in wisdom. It's like a gift of wisdom package just for us. The entire purpose is dedicated to helping us figure out how to live in such a way that our future self 
says thank you. The book of wisdom that we want to look at is actually called Proverbs. And in this book, the book of Proverbs is actually a collection of sayings. It's 31 chapters packed full of time-tested wisdom. Wisdom that when applied to our lives really can change our lives so it can help us all, no matter where we're at in life, get wiser. Uh, because we want to get wiser, because we want to grow in wisdom, we're actually challenging the entire church, all of us, to read a chapter a day of Proverbs for the month of August. So no matter where you are around the world or across the state, or whether you've been here for a week or two or a decade or two, we want all of us to choose to be wiser together by reading a chapter a day. So our hope is that you'll grab a Bible and you'll jump in, or maybe you'll jump on the LCBC app and you'll join us for the month of August reading a chapter of Proverbs. We actually created a really cool part in our app where if you jump on, it gives you the chapter, it gives you a chance to, uh, some prayer prompts, it gives you a chance to pause and reflect, it gives you the street counter, which I missed yesterday and it made me so mad that my counter went down. Like the street thing, that's a big thing for me. It's awesome, you should jump on because we want to choose wisdom. We wanna choose wisdom moving into the fall, moving into how do we respond to all the election drama, moving into school starting back, to work picking up speed, moving back into college dorms. Man, you may have heard the saying, like an apple a day will keep the doctor away. I really believe that for Proverbs, it's like a chapter a day will keep the stupid away. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but for me, I want help keeping my stupid away. I want help chasing after wisdom. But before we jump into these sayings, uh, these wisdom sayings, uh, there's a caveat, a, a caution that we gotta make. See, it's easy to think that Proverbs are like promises or Proverbs are like magic potions that if we do what the proverb says, we're guaranteed a certain outcome. Um, what these Proverbs are, they're actually, they, they highlight the general patterns of how life works. They're, they're not promises, as much as their ways of putting the odds in your favor. Um, one of the best ways I think I can think about to think about uh, Proverbs is actually think about the stock market investments. Um, so if you are invest in the stock market wisely over time, you're putting the odds in your favor that you'll make a profit, that over time there'll be enough compounding interest that is profitable, that is worth it, that it and that is a generally a true statement. But we all know people who invested and something went sideways, the markets crashed, something didn't work out. We're not guaranteed a profit, but it does put the odds in our favor. But on the flip side, we are guaranteed that if you don't invest, if you don't save, if you don't invest with your money, if you're not wise with your money, you're kind of guaranteed to be broke. And Proverbs are wise investments into our future self. Wise investment, best practices that lead us towards the best possible outcomes. So knowing that we're looking at investments and not promises, we just need to start to ask like, who wrote these Proverbs? Uh, where did they come from? How can we trust them? Why can we trust them? And how do we learn from them? So to introduce ourselves to where the Proverbs came from, I actually wanted us to look at 1 Kings chapter three, where we get introduced to a young king, a young king named Solomon. And Solomon lived about 3,000 years ago. And Solomon, you might've met his daddy. Solomon's daddy was King David. And you might've heard stories about David and versus Goliath or David and Bathsheba. Solomon's daddy was an awesome king. Made a couple of mistakes here and there, but overall an incredible king. He built the kingdom of Israel. He beat down all the invading armies. He established peace. He grows the kingdom, dies and leaves the kingdom to Solomon, sort of. See, right before David dies, there's actually a civil war. Uh, one of David's other sons, Absalom, um, causes this uprising. Things get super messy. A rebellion has to get squashed. David is a rebellious son. He actually gets stabbed to death because his hair gets caught in a tree and he's hanging there by his hair and they stab him to death. It's a really crazy story. You can read it in the Bible. It's really fun. Um, it's great for your middle school sons, by the way. But just after all of this happens and the civil war is over, David, at his old age, with a nation that's just been splintered and saved, gives it to Solomon. Happy inheritance, son. Enjoy rebuilding a fractured nation after a civil war. And I just imagine Solomon being like, thanks, dad. That's a mess. So Solomon, this young king, is trying to figure out what in the world does he do? How does he rebuild a nation from civil war? He's at a loss, but he decides to do what he saw his dad do. And he decides to go to the temple and to pray. 
And this is where we pick up the story. So I want you guys to turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, we're going to read verses 5 through 14. Uh, for the Bibles at your seat, it's on page 260. I'll give you a second just to find it in your phone if you're jumping in on the Bible app. But 1 Kings chapter 3, on page 260, and we're going to start in verse chapter 5. So here's young King Solomon, just been gifted the nation right after civil war. And it says, that night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, you showed faithful love to your servant, my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued your faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. I love that honesty. I love that moment where he's like, I'm like a little kid and I don't know what to do. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous, they cannot be counted. Give me understanding. Give me an understanding heart so I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong for who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God, uh, so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom and governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands as your father, did, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. What a moment. Solomon, he's seeking God saying, help, I'm in charge. What do I do? And God asks, what do you want? You can have anything. Now, let's be honest. If God asked me at that moment, if I wanted anything right after a civil war, and I'm now in charge, if I was given that opportunity, I would have had some very clear request. Like I would have been requesting, God, can you help no one betray me? Or can you help me not get ran out of the Capitol? Or can you help me not to be threatened or killed or everyone I know to be hurt? Like, don't forget Solomon just lived through the, the awfulness of a civil war. He just witnessed all those things happen to his very family. Those, are, those would be the starting point in my mind but not for Solomon. He realized that there was something better than protection, riches, or fame. Somehow or another, he knew to ask for wisdom. And this pleased God so much that he actually grants it. He gives Solomon tons of it. In fact, we're told in the next chapter what God does. In 1 Kings 4, we're told that God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded all of that of the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs. He wrote 1,005 uh, songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in the walls. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So the book of Proverbs is mostly made up of Solomon's wisdom sayings. Uh, they're either directly from him or from those who learned by him. Uh, so this summer, as we're choosing to chase after wisdom by reading through the Proverbs, we're reading wisdom that has stood the test of time, that comes vetted and proven to be worth following. So that leads us to two huge questions. Why wisdom and how to get it? Why, why should I choose wisdom? And then how do I get it? And that question is one of the first things addressed in the Proverbs. See, Solomon was such a wise guy. He knew that we would be asking, why does this even matter? Why should I even be pursuing wisdom? And so when he starts the book of Proverbs, he actually tells us in the first six uh, chapters why uh, wisdom matters. He says, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline and to help them. This is why. It, gives, it helps them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, 
to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those who understand receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Why wisdom? Why chase after this? Because wisdom leads us towards discipline, understanding, being able to do what is right, just, and fair. It gives us insight and knowledge and discernment. Like who doesn't want that? Who doesn't need that? Wouldn't you love help figuring out how to be better in the relationship with your kids? How to not fight so much with your wife? how to navigate the tension around the team, around the school, around work, around money. Or maybe, maybe you're a senior who just graduated or you're a junior who's about to become a senior and you now know all that, all that pressure of what are you gonna do with your life and the decisions of what comes next. Don't we wish we had that type of wisdom? Wisdom to know how to live better. If you don't want wisdom, if you don't see a need for wisdom, if you're not concerned about getting more wisdom, gaining more wisdom, if wisdom to you is like a waste of time, well, I mean this with so much grace. But that reality, that realization, that should terrify you. Because the only people I know who don't think they need wisdom, who don't care about being just and fair and understanding and discerning and wise, well, those people are either arrogant and they already think they know everything, or they're ignorant, and they just don't know that they don't know, or they're dangerous, because they don't care how they use people and hurt people. Guys, I really do believe that most people, most of us want to be wise. We want to walk with wisdom, that most of us want to do what is right and good and fair and just, that we wanna be good parents and great friends and trustworthy and wise. I just think a lot of us, we just don't know where to start. We want it, but we just don't know how to find it. Which leads us back to the question, why wisdom and how to get wisdom? So how do we get it? Solomon knew that would be the next question. He knew that that's what we would be asking. And so he picks up in verse seven and he says, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, of wisdom. Now, this is a, this is a loaded statement because many of us, when we hear fear of the Lord, um, we start to think like the fear of getting lightning thrown out of us or, or some very pious person saying how bad and rotten we are or a nun walking around with a big old ruler just ready to smack us when we step out of line. Uh, we think fear of punishment. But that's not the type of fear that Solomon is getting at. I actually think a couple of years ago, uh, I experienced the type of fear that Solomon is referencing here. Because uh, a few years ago, I had a friend whose wife surprised him. And on his birthday, she rented his dream sports car. Now, my buddy, he's a huge motorhead. And he can tell you all the, the, the gears and the torque and the horsepower and all the muscle car things. All I knew was it was a very, 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 very expensive car. It had very, very, very fat tires in the back. And when he cranked it, my belly vibrated. Like that's what I noticed. So a bunch of us, we jump in this car and we go out for a little joy ride. And so we're riding around and then all of a sudden we get on this long straightaway. And as you would expect, someone within the car goes, punch it. And you know what's about to happen. At one point, I see telephone pole, telephone pole, telephone pole. He punches it, and it is just, and we were going so fast. It was terrifying. And I, I'm going to tell you, it was simultaneously amazing and utterly terrifying. Like, I was scared for my life at how fast this thing went like that. Like, it was just like being shot out of a gun. Guys, in that moment, I feared that car. I saw its power, I saw its pop, I saw how much fun it could be, but I also saw how dangerous it could be. I both loved it and knew we had to respect it. Uh, that type of fear, love and respect, power and pop, is what I think Solomon is starting to get at when he speaks about the fear of the Lord. I looked up in a commentary and I loved how they unpacked this verse. This one commentary said, fear implies respect and awe. 
and at times knee knocking terror. It also acknowledges that everything, including knowledge and wisdom comes from total dependence on God. The fear of the Lord leads people towards humility and away from pride. With such an attitude, readers of Proverbs are more apt to listen to God than to their own independent judgment. Respect, awe, and at times, knee-knocking terror. The understanding that the God of the universe, creator of all life, who holds the fabric of the universe together, that that God, at the same time, knows the number of hairs on your head and the decreasing amount on mine. He knows the desires of your heart and the tears you cry at night, that he's a huge God and yet an intimate God, that he's a powerful God and yet a personal God. He's an all-knowing God who walks with you. When we walk with that God, when we respect that God, that's where wisdom starts. I love the last line in this commentary where it says, such an attitude. Readers of Proverbs are more apt to listen to God. And this is what I love. They're more apt to listen to God than their own independent judgment. Maybe that's the point Solomon is trying to make. Maybe wisdom starts when we finally realize we don't know it all. When we finally humble ourselves before God in his insights and in his ways, and we move from our dependence, from me to him, when we move from God, I got this, to, to God, I need you to help me with this. And listen to how Solomon says that we find this wisdom, how we start to get this wisdom. He starts in uh, Proverbs chapter two, the next chapter says, tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures then then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, to respect, to be in awe, to know the Lord. And you will gain knowledge of God, for the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Tune your ears, concentrate on understanding, cry out for insight, Ask, search for it. So guys, I, I just gotta ask, do you want to be wise? Are you seeking more wisdom? Are you asking for wisdom on how to have less stress about money? Are you tuning your ears on how to break out of the bad relationship cycles you've been in? Are you seeking ways to be less anxious? to have more confidence that God's got things. What, who do you want to be? Uh, what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known as someone who's wise or unwise, disciplined or undisciplined, regretful or resilient, someone who is understanding just and fair or someone who wasn't? Someone who steps up when they see injustice or someone who turns a blind eye? What do you not only want your future self to say, about you, but what do you want your family and your friends and your kids to say about you? How do we get wise? How do we tune our ears to wisdom, to realign our eyes on God, to be able to follow him towards wisdom? Thinking about that realignment, that tuning, it's actually made me think about the last Christmas I had with my dad. Um, so you see my dad pass back in uh, 2021 after a really long battle with a really rare lung disease. But the gift of that illness uh, was that dad knew his end was coming. He knew that he was on a clock. And so he was motivated uh, to do things that some of us think we just have more time for. And, and so growing up, we had this, this tradition where mom would do like 95% of the Christmas shopping. So she would get all the things we needed, wanted, you know, all the Santa wish list stuff. But dad, dad was always the wild card because dad would go out and he would buy you one gift. And you would never know what this one gift was gonna be. But you did know it was nothing you asked for. And then that one thing, you would either secretly be trying to return it without hurting his feelings, or it was the next family heirloom you would be passing down. It was always one of the two, like how do I get rid of this thing without hurting his feelings, or I'm giving this to my kids one day. Well, the last Christmas we had with dad, he decided to give all the adult kids in our family 
a nautical compass. Guys, we don't own boats. <laughs> We're not a nautical family, but he gets this nautical compass and it came in this really cool wooden box and it's this big old brass compass and, and he actually had it engraved on the inside. And so I actually took a picture of it so you could see what it looks like on the inside. But he wrote on the inside, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and uh, that verse 13, 5 actually reads, it says, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of faith. And so in that, in that photo, you'll be able to see that on the compass, he also put some other stuff on that plaque. He also put on the plaque, examine yourself. Uh, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine uh, yourselves. Am I heading all of my life in his direction? See, dad knew that he wouldn't be with us much longer but he also knew that he didn't need us to hold our hands the rest of our life. He just needed us to have the tools to reorient our lives, no matter what our lives would encounter. And wisdom, wisdom is a whole lot like a compass. It's the orientation that we point ourselves towards. It's the true north that we realign to. Or as Solomon put it, it's what we tune ourselves to. See, we're all gonna have highs, we're all gonna have lows, we're gonna have missteps, mistakes, uh, but wisdom is, in the, is found in the act of pausing, reorienting, and correcting back to the ways of God, to the ways that God says is simply best. It's the belief or the fear that when God says, this is where life is found, this is where joy comes from, that this is the good way, that he's right. And then we respect that enough to follow that, to submit to that. So guys, as we kick off this series, we just wanna pause and ask some simple questions. We just wanna ask questions like, what's our future self gonna say about us? What direction are we really going in? Is a course correction needed back to wisdom? If so, what steps do we need to take? Guys, I can't promise that if you reorient it back uh, to wisdom that life will be perfect. In fact, I can tell you that life will have pain, life will have disappointment. Um, in fact, we're promised that there will be hardships and hurdles in life. But what I can promise is that when we do orient ourselves back to God, back to God's wisdom, to God's ways, that our future self will say it's worth it but it all starts by saying we need to orient to Jesus, to tune ourselves back to the wisdom that he provides. So we wanna have a, a really honest conversation. Uh, the beauty of a compass is that it always points back to north, no matter where you are, no matter how much you've gotten off track or off uh, step, it always reorients you back to the truth. Uh, so no matter where you find yourself joining us today, because I know some of you are literally joining us from prison and you're watching online. And some of you, you're physically with us, but you feel like you're in your own jail cell of shame or regret. First of all, I just want you to know that all of you guys belong here because we're all full of folks who've made mistakes, saved by grace. And the second thing I want you to know is that this current moment, wherever you find yourself does not define you. You can still finish well. And I wanna remind us that compasses always point true no matter the starting point. So no matter where you find yourself today, I just wanna ask, which direction are you gonna start walking? Towards wisdom or away from it? Where is your life leading you? Towards wisdom or towards regret? Towards peace or towards worry? Towards respect and awe of God or towards trusting and depending upon yourself? What do you wanna be able to look back on and say, I'm so glad I made that choice. I'm so glad I finally kicked that habit. What do you want your future self to be able to say about you today? Where do you need to intentionally choose wisdom? So we're gonna pause and the music's gonna play, the lights are gonna come down and I wanna invite you guys to grab a, a piece of paper, maybe pull out your phone, go to the notes app. And I just want you to ask you two questions. I want, you to, I want to ask you the question, where do I need wisdom? Like, 
Like, where do I need wisdom with my finances or my relationships or uh, decisions or responding to conflict or how to handle money? Like, like, where do I need wisdom right now? I wanna invite you just to pause. And instead of just running ahead, thinking you know it all to say, God, God, I actually, I just got an inheritance. What, what, what do I do? How do I handle this wisely? God, I gotta make this decision about this job. How do I handle this wisely? God, my wife and I are having the same fight. How do I have wisdom on how to move forward to this? God, how do I honor my parents right now? God, I gotta make a decision about college. God, what do I do about this? Whatever, where do you need wisdom? Pause and ask God, hey, I need wisdom on and tell them. And maybe, maybe that's not the question for you. Maybe the second question is for you. Where do I already know what is wise? I know what I need to do. I know the next step I need to take, but I just need the courage to follow. Some of us, we know what the next step is. We know the direction we should be going in and it's terrifying. And we're wrestling with, is God really good? Is he really gonna come through? Is his way really the best way? Is it really worth it? Because we already know what he says is wise. We're just terrified to do it. So we're gonna give you guys about 60 seconds and just ask God, where do I need wisdom? Or God, where do I need the courage to follow? The time's yours, talk to God. God, right now, across all of our campuses, across our state, across the country and the world online, thousands of folks are pausing and they're asking you for wisdom. Wisdom in their marriage, wisdom with their kids, wisdom with their parents, wisdom with their uh, roommates, wisdom with college, wisdom with finances, wisdom with career decisions, wisdom with their anxiety, wisdom with all kinds of things. And God, you are the infinite, wise, all-knowing God who yet intimately knows us, loves us, and walks with us. And you've told us, ask, and we'll receive. And so God, thousands of us are asking for wisdom. Jesus, I pray that you will make your way clear, that we'll be able to hear your nudges, that we'll see your guidance. God, your, your nudge may come in a prompt in our heart. It may come through an idea in our head. It may come through a conversation with a friend. It may come through a proverb we read this week. But God, I pray that you give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear how you are showing us your wisdom. And then God, for a ton of us, we already know what is wise. We already know what you were saying the next step is. And, and we're just admitting we're scared. We're admitting it's, it's terrifying some days to trust you, to take that step, to follow. And so God, we are asking for courage. God, I pray that you will renew our strength. You'll renew our confidence, that you will strengthen our backbone and help us to create, courageously take the next step to fully follow. Risking, but trusting. God, thank you that you are the God who provides infinite wisdom and courage and you walk with us and you're close to us. And I pray that this week, across all the lives that make up LCBC, that we will experience your hand guiding and lovingly walking with us. Thank you that you provide us courage or you provide us wisdom and then you give us the courage to follow. Jesus, it's in your name we pray, amen.